This is the DIY Artist Route Podcast, a journey into what it takes to take your music or creative endeavor to the right people. Build your tribe of super fans and growth farm for real lasting success. This is a podcast for creative people who want to cut their own path and need a little direction along the way. Each episode, I am joined by someone who is doing what you and I do in some capacity. Sometimes that's musicians and artists. Sometimes it's innovators, business leaders, thinkers, gurus, and even entrepreneurs. Connecting with the person behind the work they do is one of the best ways to really gain something valuable. That's how we grow as individuals, as humans, and as artists. And that's what the DIY Artist Drop Podcast is all about. I am D. Grant Smith. Thanks for being with me today. Today we connect with Dave Ruck, an uncommon musician who has built his career and brand around educating people with his music. He has a unique method of performing, marketing himself, and keeping a daytime schedule of playing music instead of only playing at night. For musicians and artists with families, that's a very big deal. He'll share his insights, secrets, and methods with us in one minute. First, today's podcast is brought to you by Bandzoogle. Built for musicians, by musicians, Bandzoogle makes it easy to build a beautiful website for your music. Their step-by-step system will get you online in minutes. Choose from hundreds of mobile-friendly themes and then customize your design with Bandzoogle's easy point-and-click editor. Plus, all the features you need for a professional website are already built in. You can sell your music and your merch commission-free right on your website. You can build your fan list and send professional newsletters using their mailing list tool. You can pull in content from all of your online services, including Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud, and get live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. Plans start at just 10 bucks a month, including free registration of your own custom domain. Go to Banzoogle.com. Dot com and try it for free for 30 days and I'll give you something else you can use. Use the promo code DIYPOD to get 15% off of your first year of any Bandzoogle subscription. Right now, bandzoogle.com. Here on the route, we've talked a lot about education. Past guests on this podcast like Jeremy Young, Seth Godin, Chandler and Jay Coyle and others are leaders in online education. You don't have to have an online course to be an educator. For Dave Ruck, his blog and his newsletter are full of incredible tips and strategies for musicians to market themselves to audiences that they wouldn't otherwise think about. He is a professional musician who is also a big proponent and someone who highly prioritizes his family. He's built his career in a way that he can do both without sacrificing either one. And that by itself is a feat. Dave joins us to talk about how to get more gigs, how to network to grow, how to really use social media to build relationships, and a whole lot more. Are you ready to get started? Good. Lace up those shoes and let's hit the DIY artist route. I want to welcome a friend of mine. And uh, somebody that has been inspiring me and a ton of other musicians across the country for a long time, Dave Ruck. He is a musician, educator, and blogger from Buffalo, New York. Dave, welcome to the DIY Artist Route. Thank you. What a generous uh, introduction. Oh, well, absolutely true. I I read your blog every time you post uh, a new one, and I always learn something, or even even... How should I say this? I learn something every time, but aside from learning new things, you present you present insights and and kind of a um, a mindset shift every 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 blog article. And I love kind of challenging mindsets, and so I think that's one reason why I've, I've been drawn to your stuff. Oh wow! Well, thanks so much. I, yeah, I guess I don't intend necessarily to. Uh try to change anybody's mind on anything. But yeah, I guess I do come at uh, the, kind of the business of music from a, a somewhat different place from where a lot of people come to it from. So uh, I appreciate you saying that it uh, it makes you think a little differently. That's great. Well, I mean, 
one of the things that that I really get out of your presentations and the and the way that you articulate things is that there are some opportunities for musicians to be heard to grow their audience and to make a difference in their community and it's right under their nose and every every blog article you have a you have a, you talk about a lot of the same things but you you there's a, something new every single time it's not rehashing the same old stuff um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I started um, the blog just in December of 2015. It's all stuff I've had on my mind and have been talking one-on-one with other musicians that I know about uh, for years. And I've always wanted to start putting it all down somewhere. And um, there does, you know, I guess it all started locally for me in the sense that there are lots of fabulous musicians here in Buffalo, New York, where I live. Um People who have been playing, gosh, 20, 30, some of them 40 years around town, uh, super talented, um, and yet maybe still working for the same money that they were making, you know, 30 years ago um, in the bars and, and those kind of gigs. And so the the whole blog, the you know, I guess my reasons for putting everything down on the blog was just first to help some people locally who had been asking me, you know, how do you get these other kinds of gigs and, um, uh, you know, how do you market yourself? I have a, a bit of a background in marketing before I branched off as a full-time musician in 1992. I was in uh, a white-collar job in marketing. So every article that I've written to this point, there's uh, about three dozen articles on the blog right now. I've tried to take one thing at least, that I've learned in terms of booking myself. You know, I've been booking myself for over 20 years um, and put it out there. So some of it's sort of general marketing stuff that can anybody can benefit from. And like you said, some of it's a little more specifically targeted to people who um, maybe aren't seeing all the opportunities that are sort of available in the, in the local and regional area where they live. One of the big things you talk about is getting into schools and getting into libraries and, and very civic organizations to get in front of new audiences. And I'm guessing that by performing in front of these people, I'm I'm hoping and, and, and assuming in a way that there's a financial um, incentive there, but also you're getting in front of a captive audience of kids, but also an, a captive audience of adults too, right? Oh, yeah, very much so. Uh, in fact... Certainly in schools, you know, uh, the audience is going to be 90-something percent kids, but there's going to be, you know, anywhere from 5 to 30 teachers or so who are there. And so they're being exposed to what you do as well. And then in more public venues, like you mentioned libraries, some of the shows I do in libraries are actually for adult audiences and others are for kids and others are kind of multi-generational. So it's definitely... um, you know, and these are audiences that may or may not be spending money to go hear live music in more traditional music venues, right? So it is a great way to get in front of a kind of a wide cross section of of your own community. Um, but you're right. I mean, what what drew me to these kind of gigs? I actually had a, a terrible tendonitis problem in my right arm um, in the early '90s. I was I was playing a lot of music in the bars around Buffalo. I was in my twenties. And um, I developed a, a bad case of tendonitis to the point where I had to stop banging out. You know, I was playing in some pretty loud bands, and uh, I'm a guitar player. So uh, playing three, four hours a night, you know, trying to be heard over the cacophony of everything else that was going on, I did some damage to my arm, and I had to, I had to step back from that sort of performing. And so I started to look around for what else could I do to stay active in music, uh, but not continue to to uh, play those kinds of gigs and so um, one of the things that drew me to the schools and libraries and those sorts of things is they actually pay really well uh, and I was I had made the leap in 92 from a, a white collar job to doing music full time so and I was starting to have kids and um, I got married and a uh, house and bought a house all within a couple of years so I was really feeling like I needed to to be financially solvent uh, with my music so all those things sort of combine to lead me towards these other kinds of gigs. In regards to performing at schools and at libraries, would you could could you kind of um I guess 
give us like what are what are three steps that a musician could do if that, that all this is like wow you know I I wouldn't mind getting in front of some new people and maybe making some money instead of playing a bunch of free shop free shows at coffee shops. What what, right. what would you say like that an artist or do and I'm, I could do I'm, I'm thinking like you know or is there like a three step program or you know something that you could say that you know if you just do this this and this you have a pretty good chance of of having these opportunities. Um. Well, let's see if I can be succinct about it. Um, you know, I view schools and libraries somewhat differently because in schools you're really dealing with a set of educators who have specific things that they need to be doing with their kids every day. So in that setting, the better a musician can tie what they're doing to what they're already learning at school, the more opportunities you're going to have. So that's kind of an that's kind of an oddball thing. Maybe we can come back to that in a minute. It's a great I mean, I've I've I'd say it's probably my bread and butter at this point is performing in schools, but it's a very particular thing. So maybe we could start with libraries, which are kind of accessible to any musician who uh does live performances. Uh, in a library, you're basically dealing, you know, one of one of the missions of most public libraries is to entertain and educate their communities, right? And they do that through a variety of things. Some libraries have concert series in the summer. Some of them do um, kind of just here and there performances through the fall and spring, uh, sometimes related to school breaks and such when they know the, you know, the kids in town are going to be off for a full week. Maybe they'll do a series of of programs. So for libraries, for musicians who are interested in playing libraries, I would say, um, you know, the, the biggest piece or the, the, the biggest hurdle is just to get your name out there to make sure every library in your community knows that you're available to perform there and, uh, you know, has some sort of idea of what it is that you do. Um, libraries book a wide variety of stuff really from, you know, classical music to folk musicians to singer-songwriters to for outdoor s- summer concerts, they'll book full bands. Um, not every library does it, and some libraries have big budgets for it. Some have fairly modest budgets for it. So it's really, you know, there's no real sort of clearinghouse I can direct anybody to. Like if you just sign up here, you'll get a bunch of gigs. It's more like, um, and I've always advocated for this, sort of create your own database. Um, if you're interested in performing in libraries, let's say, and you, you're interested, you're willing to travel, let's say, a two-hour radius from where you live, you know, when you have some time in front of a computer, find every single public library in a two-hour radius of where you live and start to compile, you know, who's the head librarian, either get their phone number or get their email address and make your develop your own database so that you own you essentially own the platform that's going to allow you to perform in these places. So once once you develop your own database of contacts, then it's just a matter of reaching out to them every so often and reminding them that you're there and this is what you do and the bookings will come. You're talking about something that uh, that I'm a big advocate for too, which is, is keeping record of the people that you contact and being very um, intentional about the relationships that you're initiating. Uh, Absolutely. And in, in in my book, um, which I think I think you've read, uh, the DIY yeah. Musicians Radio Handbook. I, you know, I think it's important, and, and you can take exactly what you're doing is is the exact same thing that I talk about in the book, which is uh, as you're going about contacting people, keep track of of those conversations, and keep track with with the people, and know know a little bit about those people before you reach out to them, so that you've got something to reference, and it's not just hey. Uh, I'm trying to get a gig and I don't really know who I'm talking to and I don't really care. Just give me a gig, <laughs> which that's, is what most people do. That's such a good point. And I love that about your book. I mean, it's really all comes down to relationships, right? And um, it's always a person on the other end of that email. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, and, and this is the unfortunate part for a lot of musicians who who don't who don't really enjoy and I don't enjoy sitting in front of my computer hours every day, keeping notes on who I've talked to. And, but you know what, that's the only way I know to, to keep my calendar full. And so that's what I do. I mean, I, I basically treat my, my home 
hours, you know, when I'm not out gigging, I treat it like a nine to five job. If I'm off and I don't have a gig today, I'm going to be in my office in front of my computer basically from nine to five developing these contacts and reaching out and finding out, oh, okay, you do your concerts in the fall and what kinds of things do you like to book and making notes on that. So the next time I get in touch, just exactly what you said, you know, it's not, it's not this cold thing and it's not all about me. It's not about I'm, you know, here I am. I, why don't you book me? You know, I have this great band. It's more like I know you like to do things in the fall, and and uh, you said your audience really responded to so and so who got the audience involved and stuff. So you know, got the who was got the audience to sort of interacted with the audience or got them singing or whatever it was that the librarian mentioned they like to see from a performance, and you know, talking, speaking directly to that. It's about them. It's about what they need. It's not about us. I love that, man. I love that you said that. That is that is right on. And uh, some of the past couple of um, folks that have been on, on this podcast have said some of the same things, including uh, Steve Palferman and Amy Schmittauer, that, you know, we, we spend so much time as, as artists and creators focused so exclusively on our work, but we sometimes ignore the fact that our work is for people other than us and <laughs> by... Uh, by by taking the time and making ma- you, we were talking earlier on about a mindset shift with a mindset shift of what what I what I do and what you do too, which is growth farming. The mindset is not on me 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 me. The mindset is on okay, how can I think about what I'm doing from the perspective of the people that I want to reach out to, and what is it that they're going to most uh, want from me to make a connection. A hundred percent agree. Um, so you're serving as your own booking agent, which is something that, um, a lot of DIY musicians are doing as well. Uh, and from what you just said, booking is about building relationships. So how do you maintain and grow your booking? Uh, well, as, as you know, we all learned in our business 101 class, if you ever took anything like that, um, Referrals are always your number one uh, source of bookings, and so repeat business is your number one. The, essentially, the more gigs you do, the more the greater percentage of your new bookings are going to come from uh, those existing bookings. So, um, word of mouth uh, probably being number two. So, number one, um, you know getting rebooked from places you've worked and we're happy with you. Once you're in the door, that's the hard part is getting the first booking. Once you've gotten that, you have a greater likelihood of going back to that place. Word of mouth, so from happy customers, happy uh, venues who've had you perform, that's huge. Um, And then, you know, there's a fair amount of outreach that I do on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Um, you know, I have a database of thousands and thousands of contacts at this point at schools, at museums, at libraries, at, at community events, at uh, music festivals, at folk music venues. I play in a three-piece string band, and so we work in some kind of different markets from what I do solo. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, it's all of those things. It's a great combination of all of that. And, of course, um, kind of trying to be strategic about where you are online, what you do with social media. Um, I think you and I have talked about this before, the fact that you're kind of much better off sort of finding one or two social channels that you can really uh, find an audience on uh, and rather than sort of trying to be everywhere and doing everything a little bit half-assed, trying to find a couple of social media channels that are right for you and where you can reach new people. Um, And, you know, sharing just like you do, sharing a bunch of free stuff, sharing videos that are fun or funny, uh, but all the while sort of reinforcing in your marketplace's mind that this is what you do and, and, uh, you know, you're you're a good guy, you're a generous person who is interested in the greater good. Um, And... I think all that helps, you know? I think that's, yeah, I think that's very good. Very, very good. I want to ask a little bit about the travel side because if you've got thousands of contacts in your, um, 
in your book of, of people that you've worked with or people that you've networked with that you've done a bit of traveling outside of just the Buffalo, New York area. And, oh, yeah. and so with that in mind, for people that th- there are some artists that are that listening to you talk about your experiences and talk about how, you, like, as you said a minute ago, your bread and butter is is doing gigs at schools and at libraries and at these civic um, public places, this this might be kind of a mind blowing sort of experience in mm. terms of thinking about like oh well that there's all these opportunities now that I never thought of before. In regards to distance and travel for this stuff, for people that are just just starting to look at the potential of playing in front of these types of audiences, what would you say would be a good uh, distance ratio for them to to look at it, or and what what should they avoid? Um, gosh, I, I mean, I always say the wider you can cast your net, you know, the busier you're going to be. And, and so for me, um, leaving Buffalo, New York, where I live was the difference between doing this part time and being able to do it full time, right? There's just not enough work locally. And I happen to live in a somewhat dense part of the Northeast, right? With a lot, with a fair amount of population, Certainly for people who live out in the Southwest or other parts of the country that are less populated, uh, it's even more important to, you know, if if you're interested in kind of uh, being able to do this full time or making decent money at it, it's important to have a car (laughs) that that works really well. I drive for 10 years now. I've been driving a hybrid, you know, a a little Prius, which my kids can't stand. (laughs) They think it's the ugliest thing, you know, they, they want me to, at this point, you know, one of them's in high school and one of them's in college and the high school, my, my younger son, you know, he wants me to drop him off like a block away from school so nobody sees him exiting the Prius. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I, I get f- close to 50 miles to the gallon and with the amount of driving I do, I do, I put on about 35 or 40,000 miles a year. Um, but I've structured all my travel so that I can come home most nights because I do have kids and I still have one who's at home and I don't want to be gone. I really can't. I mean, I could, but I don't want to be gone, you know, a week, two weeks at a time. I I just don't want to miss those kinds of chunks of their lives. And so I've structured pretty much all my travel so I can get up. I might have to get up really early in the morning, like 3 or 4 a.m. so that I can make it to Ithaca or, or Albany or wherever um, for a 9 a.m. show at a school, and then on my way back, I might hit another school, or I might do a library in the afternoon, and then I'll be home for dinner even. Mm. Um, and then I might even get up the next morning and do the whole thing again, but at least I get some time at home. Um, but I'm not directly answering your question. In terms of, <laughs> in, in terms of uh, you know, what I would recommend for other people, the the, the farther you can travel, the, the, the greater the opportunity. So I would cast your net as, as wide geographically as you can imagine yourself traveling. Very good. Very, very good. So the, the mindset of, well, I, I don't want to get too far away from home, so I've got to just hunker down and, and see what I can get here. Uh, you just kind of blew that one out of the water. Well, that's fine. I mean, if, if that's what, if that's what's going to work better for somebody, then more power to them and they'll, you know, there's ways to dig in more locally and, and try to get the most out of it that you can. Um, but certainly, yeah, I mean, the more you travel and, and the more towns and cities you can cover, uh, the greater number of venues there are for you to play in. And, you know, I think another important aspect of that is make sure you're charging for not only your expense to get there, but your time, right? So I have a rate that I charge when I perform locally. If I'm driving four hours to do that same kind of show, I'm going to add on to my fee not only my expenses to get there and back, but I'm going to add in a significant amount for my time because I'm basically spending an eight-hour day going there and back, right? And that, you know, your time's worth something too. So those are just some things to, to consider, with traveling. Oh, that's really good advice. And that's really good advice for, for anybody in, in the I don't know, creative space, whatever we're in of, uh, doing presentations and I do, I do speaking too. And, and so like th- keeping that in mind is, is very good. So much to ask, uh, <laughs> so many different ways to go. I want to talk about how and, and kind of, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you with, with, with this kind of little pivot we're going to do now. Uh, and talk a little bit about where you and I met, because 
we met in kind of an unconventional place for you to think about building new relationships and and colleagues and people that you end up getting to be a part of their story and they get to be a part of yours. All right, Dave, let's talk about building real and authentic relationships via social media, which is, and you and I can describe, can define this very well because we understand what that means. It's opposite of, of a lot of, a lot of things. And let's, let's call it what it is. It's a mindset shift. So you and I met in a, a Twitter conversation, right? Yeah. I mean, I want to say either Twitter or Facebook, cause I know you're on both and I'm on both and I've seen you post things on both, but one way or the other, Sometime early in 2016, I noticed one of your posts or you noticed one of mine and we had a little um, social media exchange as as we all often do. But uh, what I really appreciated was that you then said, which is something almost nobody does, you said, why don't we have a phone conversation sometime? I'd love to get to know you better. So we took it, so, you know, essentially from online to offline, we had one phone conversation, which was delightful. You know, we talked for, I don't know, a half hour, 45 minutes. And so now we call each other friends, right? We've never even met in person, but um, it, I think that just points up how important relationships are and one-on-one conversations are. Um, and I wish I, I wish I worked more of that into my own uh, world in terms of my social media interactions. Almost nobody takes a social media conversation and then picks up a phone and continues it, right? Mm. I think that was really, uh, it was really eye-opening that you did that and uh, just, again, sort of reinforces that whole thing that I guess the sales and marketing world even have known for a long time, which is when the businessman comes and, and takes you out to lunch and and sit and this when the sales guy comes and visit your office and takes you out to lunch personally rather than just talking to you over the phone or by email, your, your whole relationship transforms because you've, you know, you've shared this sort of more intimate thing. Social media is sort of, um, you know, it's, it's great to connect with people on social media, but it's, it's maybe the, the low, the lowest rung on the, on the connection chain. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I was I was glad that really glad you reached out to me, and I think it's uh, just a smart way to go about relationships. Well, for me, the the social media avenues create an opportunity to meet people and have the initial um, introduction to people that you might not have otherwise had. But it's it, it's it's right on with what you said. It, the, the the difficult thing I think for all of us is there's a little bit of a trust. Uh, barrier that we're like, okay, I followed you and I clicked the button, but do you really want to talk to me or are you trying to get something <laughs> from me? And right. I, I, I mean, I experienced that in a variety of ways and social media isn't the only one. Email is probably the biggest where strangers, absolute strangers are emailing me and asking me to scratch their backs or give them a handout or whatever without paying any attention whatsoever to any of the platforms that I have or, or know anything about me, they just know my email address. And so I understand the trust uh, gap. Um, but I think that you overcome that trust gap by being intentional and by illustrating that you're actually interested in the person. So asking questions and trying to really get to know somebody, th- to me, there's a whole lot that's been missing from from the process of building real connections and social media being an, an ap- opportunity for that. We're all looking, for the most part, musicians, creative people, businesses, marketers, everybody, we're all looking for quick, fast, hard wins. <laughs> and when we don't take the time to actually get to know people and have conversations, then we really miss out on gold that's right in front of us because we're going to give so much more to people that we're in real relationships with and we're, we're really friends with than we are just people that we... Um, have clicked a button on a page that said that we're following friends, whatever. Absolutely. Um, Yeah, I I mean, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, you said we're missing some gold there when we don't talk in person. I think we're maybe missing more than gold. I think we're missing really the root of it all, which is, uh, you know, without that, it's just me talking about me or me sharing something on social media and, and, 
yeah, I, it's, it, I'm not adding anything to your comment. It's, <laughs> it's uh, a very well said and, uh, yeah, just can't overemphasize the, uh, the value of those, those, those personal relationships. Well, there's a good friend of mine, um, a guy named uh, Shane Freeman out of Atlanta who has this really cool music podcast called The Muse, and it's, it's spelled M-I-E-W-S, I believe. But uh, he, he and I, uh, similarly to you and I, Dave, um, I think we both met on Twitter. And we, we did exactly what, what you've talked about. We, we had a phone conversation. And, and Shane is, is really smart. He's really well connected. And he's really, um, he's really wise in what he does. But one of the things that first struck me about the, the interaction that we had, and it's, it, I, this is building on the, the thing that you just said about you know, we're missing more than just gold. Uh, he talks about how most people operate on this premise that it's all about who you know. And in a way, that's true. I mean, that's an old-fashioned, you know, business uh, mantra and tactic of, you know, you gotta get got to get out and get, get known and, and get to know people. But what he says is it's not about who you know, it's about who knows you back. And the thing that social media has in the ways that it's been an opportunity for us to get to know new people, it's also been a hindrance in a way because we, we, we forget about the fact that w- the relationship is a two way street and somebody knowing you back is really where the gold is. And mm-hmm. so that's for me, like when, I, what I do is, you know, I don't spend a lot of time scouring Twitter, trying to find some new person to talk to. But when, when I do see, you know, a post or somebody that looks like what they're doing is really interesting, I will initiate a conversation and that response, the response is what I'm looking for. If they don't respond back, then that's not somebody I'm probably going to have a conversation with because they're obviously not interested in even just texting a message back. But a response yeah. means, okay, cool. Maybe we can, maybe we can get to know each other better. And that's really what I'm in the interest of doing. And that's, I think that's what we're all should be in the business of doing, which is building relationships. And that's got to, that's got to, that's got to involve more conversation than just something that we're typing with our fingers. Absolutely. And, you know, I, if I can uh, go back to the point, um, a minute ago, I, I remembered what I was wanting to say and then forgot, which is, um, you know, you mentioned the, the importance of relationships and, and there being gold there without it, you know, if we're just, if I'm just, blasting emails at people who I think would be interested in what I do and if people are just blasting you emails, you know, trying to get something from you, you're really missing the whole point, which is you're missing the most critical information, which is what is that person that we're blasting, what is it that they want? What is it that they need? Because again, I mean, it's all, I wrote an article called, uh, you know, want better gigs, it's not about you. Mm -hmm. Um, we all get so wrapped up in, well, if, we, if I just tell people how good I am or how cool my music is or how this or that or how many awards it's won, they're going to they're gonna want to act. They're going to want to uh, book me for their radio show or they're going to want to have me come and perform or they're going to want to buy my CD or whatever it is. You're missing the critical piece without talking to the person, which is what is, what is it that drives them, you know? Um, it's, it's the whole thing. It's interesting you, you bring that up because uh, I, I gave a speech last night where I talked about the exact, <laughs> the exact same thing. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's interesting. We, we are, and I, I, I'm, I know that your experience with this is true, and, and if, guys, as, as you're listening to this, just, just think about this for a minute. We are hardwired as human beings to care about people who care about us. We are also hardwired as human beings to, not, to be resistant to people that only care about themselves. <laughs> and so it, it's, it's just, it's in all of our collective DNA. It doesn't matter what part of the country or what part of the world you're from. It doesn't matter uh, what ethnicity you're, you are, what uh, race you are, what your economic background is, uh, where you went to school. If you went to school, none of that stuff matters. doesn't matter whether you're male or female. We are hardwired as individuals to be interested in and more engaged with people who pay attention to us. We, we are really, if we were all football players, we're all more inclined to want to be receivers because we want people to throw us the ball. But most people want to spend all their time trying to be the quarterback and throw the ball to everybody else, but nobody's catching it if you're not paying attention to the receiver that you're throwing it to. Hmm. 
And since we're hardwired in that way, thinking about things in terms of engaging with people and caring about them and communicating that value, that's how you grow. It's not a matter of, well, I want, I want to build this thing and I want to be big and I want, I want, I want, so I've got to focus on me, 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 me. That doesn't do crap. What works is, okay, who is it that I want to get in front of? These people. Okay, well, who is it that they're listening to? These two people. How can I get in front of those two people? Let me, let me figure out a little bit about them. Let me spend some time reading the things that they do and let me try to start some conversations. I read this incredible blog yesterday. The guy was basically pulling stuff from my playbook, but actually he's been doing it a lot longer, so maybe I'm pulling stuff from his. But he said the number one thing that gets... It's a, it was an article in Entrepreneur Magazine. The number one thing that gets him business all the time and has been growing his business for the past 15 years is something that most people aren't doing, and he's absolutely right. It's not about pitching. It's not about having a marketing campaign that works and great visuals and all this stuff. He says he starts 100 powerful conversations with people every week and in powerful conversations he builds interest and he might not be giving a presentation but you get people interested in what you're doing and willing to say yes from having conversations not from being all markety and pitchy and salesy and gimmicky absolutely and i never heard it put that way about you know uh how those sorts of things are hardwired in our dna but it makes all the sense in the world and when i think about most or maybe all of my best friends, they're all people who demonstrated a fondness for me maybe first, you know? So Mm -hmm. think about that. I mean, we all, like you said, I mean, we all want want to be, we need to be listened to and feel like we're being listened to and appreciated. And uh, that transforms the relationship for sure. And what I try to do, even in my my sort of cold, if you will, marketing, uh, you know, the times when I'm sending an email to a couple thousand venues um, offering a new new presentation or whatever it is, you know, I, I, I do lots of outreach all throughout the year. I try, to, I try to work in as much language as I can from actual conversations I've had with people like the people that I'm emailing. So in other words, I take all that feedback, you know, I, I intensely listen. Anytime I've been booked somewhere and I go there, I make sure to ask the person who booked me a bunch of questions about, you know, so, you know, how's your venue running this year? Uh, uh, how have audiences been? Uh, you know, who else have you booked and what's gone over really well? All those sorts of things. And you start to, over time, you start to see patterns, you know, okay, these people really care about X, Y, and Z. So when I'm typing my my outreach email, even if it's not a personalized email to one person, I'm incorporating some of those things I already know about that audience that I'm emailing. And that can make a big difference too in your marketing. Absolutely. It was, it was said, one thing that was said to me last night in my, um, my speaking deal, um, the, the overall theme was about leadership. And uh, the leaders of the, of the meeting said, you know, if you want to be a good leader, you need to understand how to be a good follower and ask yourself the question, would I follow me if, <laughs> if I were, you know, in the shoes of, of my audience of the people that I'm trying to get in front of? And I was like, wow, that's brilliant. And he's yeah. like, you know, it's in the same way, if you want to be a good presenter or a good speaker, you need to be a good listener so that you can know how to process what's being spoken. And take action on it. And so in all of these ways, as we're talking about building relationships and growing and, you know, succeeding as musicians and as creative entrepreneurs, the thing that we want to gain, we need to learn how to be and how to do. Absolutely. Um, all right. I want to kind of uh, get back to the subject we were talking. This has all been really good, Dave. I really appreciate your you insights. I'm enjoying it. Um, education is a big value to you. I'm curious why education is kind of the pathway you've chosen to really, um, grow your brand. Um, it's a good question. I think it's a combination of forces. One is that I love, you know, and maybe this is right back to what we were just talking about, but I love to feel useful and I love to, I love to, uh, to be valuable and I love to so when you come into a situation where you can not only entertain people but maybe teach them about something um, 
it, it makes me feel good and it makes me feel useful and it makes me feel like I'm contributing to the greater good, right? Um, so that's one. And, you know, to be perfectly frank, when you can combine entertainment with education, your, your marketability increases and your rates increase. You know, mm. I'm able to charge several times what I was able to charge as a musician who played in bars and, and those sorts of gigs because – what you're doing is a lot more valuable to the person who's buying it. Um, so education, educating is not only something I really love to do and makes me feel good, um, but it, it puts me into a different marketplace where I can actually make a sustainable living as a musician. That's, well, that's, that, that's, a, lot of, that's a lot of insight uh, that I hadn't thought about in terms of like <laughs> growth in, in, a, in a different way. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a guy named Mick Maloney who maybe some of your audience will be familiar with. He's uh, an Irish musician who's been living in America for 40 years or more. And he, uh, ever since he came here, he made it a point to kind of, you know, travel around a bit in the Northeast here in the U.S. and find Irish American musicians who maybe had ties to the old country and to Ireland's traditional music. And he sort of championed them, like he'd go and learn their stories and how the music that they played connected with where they were from. And he'd present these musicians. So he sort of made a name for himself, not only as a musician, but as someone who can put an evening together where he's going to bring these two or three guys or, and girls from different parts of Ireland together. And he's going to present them in a concert and talk to them in between songs and, and, you know, it's, so it's this whole sort of wonderful intermarriage of some great music. And you're getting the real cultural context of where the music comes from. And it's a model I really love. And it's something I do a lot with when I perform for adult audiences. I do a lot of work in historical societies and, and other sort of folk music venues where you can sort of uh, present interesting material. My material is all older. I do a lot of traditional music um, and sort of tie in the stories of, and the context of where it comes from. But Mick Maloney said to me, I, he, uh, we did a concert together in New York um, uh, several years ago, and he said something like, and I love this, and it's always stuck with me, he said, he said, to educate and entertain, I don't think there could be a higher calling for a person, right? Mm. And uh, it really, because, I mean, that is essentially what I've been trying to do for 20-some years, is to entertain while educating or vice versa, and... Um, it really, uh, to hear it put that way from somebody like him, it really has always stuck with me. And I, I tend to agree with him. I mean, it, it's a great use of <laughs> this life that I've been given, you know. I really feel that way. Last question for you, Dave. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, let's see, how do I say this? Just uh, say it. Well, Okay. It's not really all that profound. I, I wanted to give credit for where I got the idea from, and that's kind of what the hesit hesitancy was. Um, credit goes to Steve Palfreyman, uh, my good friend who uh, inspires people all over the world every week. Um, but this is, this is something that, that is from his wheelhouse. Uh, he's very big on legacy, and that's kind of where I want to wrap up our conversation. I want to know what is the number one thing that you want to be known for when it's all said and done. <laughs> Um, to be perfectly honest, it's a question I've never had a good answer for. Um, I don't, you know, not, it's really not what motivates me. Um, what motivates me is more sort of what happens in the present moment. And if I'm able to, to, uh, touch somebody, if I'm able to reach a certain segment of an audience, if I'm able to convey something that people didn't know in a way that uh, they enjoyed learning it, those are the sorts of things that make me really happy. And um, it's just, I don't know. I mean, nothing I'm doing is so profound that I think I'm going to be remembered for it after the fact. It's just, um, you know, if anything, I hope uh, I hope people would, uh, I hope, okay, here's, here's something I, I do hope uh, is that, a lot of we haven't really touched on this in this talk, but I've done a tremendous amount of research into older musical traditions of my region in the north in New York State, um, and brought a bunch of music sort of out of the archives and off of old obscure field recordings, and 
brought those out and recorded them and performed them for mo- for modern day audiences and and you know sort of provided some context so people can understand oh 150 years ago right people didn't have radios so where did their music come from mm. well they had to make it themselves or they had to go stand where someone else was making it and stand there and listen so there's this whole legacy there's this whole body of traditional music that every community had and every community's music was a little different right uh music was much more local 150 years ago and so I've done a tremendous amount of research trying to dig out the old traditional music from my region. What were people singing and playing on their back porch or at a community gathering 150 years ago? And uh, I've documented a lot of that. I've put websites together and I've put uh, CDs together. Um, and so if anything, that would be a great thing to be remembered for. Mm. Very good. Uh, Dave, what is the best place for people to uh, connect with you, subscribe to your blog, and get more, um, build a build a connected relationship with you? Ah, well, uh, any number of ways. I mean, my website is just my name, Dave Ruck, and Ruck is spelled R-U-C-H. So it's DaveRuck.com. The blog is at DaveRuck.com forward slash advice. And that's where you can find about three dozen articles on marketing yourself to these different kinds of venues and and uh, doing that kind of work and getting those kinds of gigs. Um, and then, you know, I'm all over social media. Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn are my primary uh, channels. So you can just find me there under my own name. It's a fairly unusual name. So it's Dave Ruck, R-U-C-H. Awesome. Dave, thank you so much for being on the DIY Artist Route. You are awesome and uh, look forward to talking with you more in the future. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on, D. Dave Rock, musician and music educator, helping artists and creatives learn how to grow by helping other people. Read his blog and sign up for his newsletter. It's an encouraging experience every week. Dave is such an encouraging person. Every part of that chat that we just had, just like every interaction that I have with him, gives me a strong dose of encouragement and joy. I follow Dave not only because of his great content, but also the heart behind it is so loving and so powerful. And these are great reasons to follow the people who are leading you forward. Speaking of leading you, Dave and I talked about how we first connected on Twitter and that led to a phone call. As you know, I'm big on relationship building. That is what growth farming is all about. If you want to have a conversation with me, get some specific insights into how to grow your music or how to build your entrepreneurial endeavor, connect with me on Twitter, just like Dave did. I'm at Appetizer Radio. Reference this podcast when you contact me and we'll have a chat. I know that there are a ton, ton in all caps of podcasts out there and I appreciate you choosing this one to be a part of your day. If any of this podcast connected with you in any way, shape, or form, share it with your friends now to help them grow. Give them the link to hear it and tell them one more thing. Say, I love you. Seriously, give love always. Love has more value on this planet than anything else. And you can give love to me by subscribing to this podcast and even beyond that, joining my Growth Farmers list at dgrantsmith.com. It's the Growth Farmers Almanac on the main page. You like that? Sound creative? Well, sometimes I get some clever stuff. Connect with me and I'll share more clever things with you. That's it for this time. We'll pick up again next time with a new journey person to teach us even more about how to grow as artists, creative entrepreneurs, and human beings. Be uncommon this week, my friend, and keep growth farming. I'm D. Grant Smith. I will see you next time right here on the DIY Artist Route.